How does Jeff Halfley change the plans for the Packers defensively? How does it change the type of prospects they might be looking at? And who are the players Green Bay could be targeting to fill key needs in just two weeks? Field Yates from ESPN joins us on today's show. You are locked on Packers. Your daily Green Bay Packers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski and I cover the Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, however you find podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked On Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet and the show for fans who know what happened. They want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus. Bonus bets guaranteed. That's 150 bucks, win or lose. Visit fandle.com slash locked on to get started. Field Yates from ESPN. First Draft is the name of the podcast. Him and Mel Kuyper Jr., the absolute legend on the show. Field is a uh, former uh, evaluator himself. And so he's got terrific insight, knowledge, still has connections around the league, a terrific reporter, analyst, one of the most... Uh, well-rounded football people we have in the media. We are very lucky to have him on the show today. So let's get into our conversation with Field. Joining me now from ESPN, the podcast is first draft with the legend, Mel Kuyper Jr., a legend in his own right. Um, Field Yates and and Field, it is excellent to be with you. Um, I'm, I'm so glad, and I told you this when we when we uh, met at Super Bowl, that I'm, I'm so glad that they're letting you off the leash with the draft stuff because <laughs> I just think that you guys do such a great job um, and I'm, I'm really enjoying the, the conversations that you guys are having. Before we get to the draft, though, I understand that you happen to know a little bit about the Packers' new defensive coordinator, Jeff yeah. Rafley. What, what can you tell me about him? Because in order to figure out who the Packers might want, we got to figure out what this defense is going to look like. Yeah, so I'm married to a Boston College graduate, so that always gives you a little bit of a leg up in your Packers prep for 2024. Uh, so it was disappointing to see Jeff Halfley leave the program uh, yeah. just because of the fact that, uh, well, there's enthusiasm right now surrounding the hire of Bill O'Brien at Boston College. You know, when Halfley landed in BC, that was a big hire. Uh, and he felt like he was the kind of coach that maybe uh, had a chance to have some real staying power uh, at Boston College. He had a good sort of youthful exuberance that I think is almost required right now for college football, given how much the landscape has changed. And he yeah. was literally a very young head coach as well. Uh, so he did a pretty solid job there. Uh, the reality of that job is that there is a ceiling on it. You can have an occasional year in which you make a real run, but uh, to have sustained success at Boston College is going to be really difficult, especially in the world of NAL when, when you have a good player who slides through the recruiting cracks and you have a breakout freshman season or sophomore season at Boston College, you're going to have a bunch of the power programs coming after you. And I can't blame a kid if someone offers you something that is literally too good to refuse. So yeah. that's going to be a challenge for a lot of the programs that aren't at the obvious top of the totem pole in college football. But as far as how Jeff Halfley wants to run his defense, we know there's going to be a lot of man coverage, a lot of guys that can run as well on the perimeter. Uh, I think the cornerback and – Safety to a degree were already needs for the Packers prior to the defensive coordinator hire, uh, and they remain that right now, even after the addition of Xavier McKinney in free agency, who was one of my favorite players, by the way, uh, for it, it yeah. hit, hit the open market. That was a rare, true, him and Christian Wilkins were like the two true blue defensive free agents where usually when a guy reaches free agency, sorry for the aside here, uh, no, the question please. is, why did his team let him reach free agency, right? Right. Uh, and in the case of Wilkins and McKinney, sometimes it's as simple as just the team is squeezed due to other factors. Miami has a tight salary cap right now with high salaries for guys like Tyree Kill and Teron Armstead and Bradley Chubb and, and Jalen Ramsey and more and more and more, plus the pending to a Tonga Bailoa extension. Meanwhile, for the Giants, as we, they've been sort of on a tightrope for the past three or four years since Joe Shane became their GM and with a big money contract for Daniel Jones and the possibility of tagging Saquon Barkley again. 
McKinney ends up hitting the open market, and it was not a surprise to me at all for a guy who played every defensive snap last year, literally every yeah. single one for the Giants to cash in like he did was not a surprise. And uh, as we know, this is no longer your father's Green Bay Packers. They do go big game hunting on the open market. Yeah, Brian Gutekinds has changed that that culture in a big way here. Yeah. You know, Mike McCarthy used to joke about um, the trade deadline and it being pretty quiet. The the free agent period was was often the same. Um, I, that that I think transitions seamlessly into a name that you see in every mock draft, <laughs> um, and that is Cooper DeGene for yeah. the Packers. How do you how do you view him through the lens of the Packers, right? Because we have to take the player and say, okay, these are these are the things he's good at. But for different teams, they're going to value different kinds of things. There's questions about if he's going to play corner if yeah. he lands in Green Bay. Where do you where do you see that match? I think there are two ways to approach uh, the position for Cooper DeGene. One is you state your intentions before you draft him, and some teams would say that there is more value in a corner than a safety, just because. Yeah. Look at the top of the market, right? The highest paid cornerback is making more than the highest paid safety, even if the gap is starting to narrow with guys like Xavier McKinney cashing in on the yeah. open market. That being said, um, I think that uh, corner might actually be the spot that is less popular for Cooper G. Now, I, you know, I don't talk to every scout out there. I, I can't profess that I know how every of the 32 teams views him, but I have talked to no shortage of teams that have said, yeah, he's a safety or he's a big nickel that can play safety as well. Um, there have been certainly plenty of teams that have also told me, hey, he's a perimeter corner. It's what he did at Iowa. He plays a lot of press man coverage, super confident, excellent athlete. Keep doing that in the NFL. No problem with that. Um, my approach, if I were drafting Cooper DeGene, and maybe this is being a little bit too simplistic, is I like the player enough that I would just draft him and figure it out afterwards, right? Yeah. There are guys who have played multiple spots. Uh, for the same team, for different teams. I mean, we see a lot of corners, transitions of safeties, but we also have guys that play a lot of different spots uh, that are not at the back end of their career. I think about like a Mike Hilton from uh, the Bengals right now, uh, previously of the Pittsburgh Steelers, who they, they've, he, they've just been utilized a bunch. He's an awesome blitzer, so he plays from the slot a good amount, but he's a reliable tackler. Like you kind of see him doing a little bit of everything. I think DeGene's ceiling is certainly higher than that. Yeah. Um, but I feel like if the Packers were to draft him, um, you like I would say, all right, there's your corner opposite of Jair Alexander, or he's your second safety along with – Xavier, uh, Xavier McKinney after reshaping that room after the departures of Savage and also Jonathan Owens. It's it's interesting because the, the more I watch Xavier McKinney, the more I was just sort of like, he makes he can be a force multiplier for this defense because he can allow whoever they bring in to just do what they're good at because he can do everything else. Everything, yeah. And, and that's that's the cool thing. Like if they want to get someone who can, who can play more single high, great. You can put Xavier McKinney wherever you want. If you have someone who, like Malik Mustafa, who is a player I really like from Wake yeah. Forest, let him just live in the box and come downhill with bad intentions. And, and I, like, that would be a cool way to approach this too. That, that gives the Packers a lot of flexibility. Where are you? I came to the safety class going, it's not a good class and it's, it's not a good class at the top, but I watched some of these guys on day two and maybe even early on day three. And I'm like, Oh man, I really like Dadrian Taylor Demerson. And I really like Malik Mustafa. Some of these guys, I'm like, they would be fun players. I think there are a few at the top of the class that you can say can do a little bit of everything. Jaden Hicks from Washington State had about as much positional versatility as any defensive player in the class. He's yeah. on the short list at the very least. A ton of snaps. His tape versus or Wisconsin was great. Yeah, I'm sorry to bring that up to any Badgers fans that are watching right now, but uh, that was terrific. Uh, he, he was flying around. I mean, just like ridiculous on-ball production in that game alone. Had a big pick six against Colorado State that looked mm -hmm. like a wide receiver handling a, a reception there. So natural hands, brother of a former briefly NFL player is now in the CFL, by the way, Elijah Hicks. Uh, but Jaden Hicks uh, can do a little bit of everything. Uh, but besides that, like a lot of the safeties in this class, you kind of have to pick your – specific type right right uh you mentioned dadger and taylor demerson like that's a that's a that's a free safety that's a rangy like you know that guy is going to be better served hovering in the back end like a kalen block from usc as well then you have guys who pack a little bit more punch you know cam kinchins would have been one that i thought had a chance to be kind of both from from miami uh four six five forty at the combine there are some teams that are just yeah, going to emphasize a uh, safety that runs a four six five that, that's just that's going to be a cross off for some teams. I'm not saying a cross off entirely from the board, but they're not going to use a top, let's say, 100 pick on a safety uh, with that kind of movement skills. I think Cole Bishop, he's he's been at the top of my class of late, especially since yeah. that 4-4-1 at the combine out of Utah. 
The tricky part about safeties in college, I think, is that how they're used is not necessarily a direct reflection of what it's they can tough, be. right? Yeah. I mean, some of these teams are saying, like, we don't necessarily need Cole Bishop to play a ton of snaps as a free safety because – He's been an awesome blitzer for us, and he can play in the box, and he's super fast to handle some of the sideline-to-sideline side wide receiver screens and RPOs that we've seen, uh, as opposed to being a guy who just hovers in the back end because the ball gets out so quick in college. There aren't that many like true free safeties who are patrolling the back end because so much of the action is taking place closer to the line of scrimmage. That's a long-winded way of saying that the safety class is interesting. Uh, yeah. But I think uh, other than a couple of examples, you're mostly kind of planting your flag on strong or free. Back at it with more with Field in just a second here on Locked on Packers. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to make your car the mvp and bring home huge wins keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com eligible items only exclusions do apply ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers and thanks to everyone who makes locked on packers their first listen every day are you watching fox sports or espn on the tv all day have to turn down the volume with all the shouting Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yeah, and, and again, for the Packers, that's fine because they they can yeah. have Xavier McKinney who now can do everything. Um Linebacker is another spot where if you're a Packers fan, you're okay. Yeah. Isaiah McDuffie actually played at BC, Jeff Halfley. Yeah. We don't know what Quay Walker is. Year three uh, coming in going, uh, kind of don't know. Yeah. This is not the class to need a linebacker though. Um, where do you where do you see these guys that you think they're going to start coming off the board? Because it doesn't seem like first round, though there are some mixed opinions on that. Like some people think Edrin Cooper is a legit first round kind of talent. I don't Personally, I don't see that, but where do you think these guys are going to start coming off the board? I think Cooper's on the borderline right there. I think he's a borderline top 32 player, but the reality is you're going to have like quarterbacks move up the board, right? So I have yeah. Bo Nix and Michael Penix Jr. both outside my top 32 in my top 200 rankings, which will be up, I think, April 18th or 19th. Uh, so hopefully nothing changes with too many of these prospects over the next week or so. Um, but those guys are both really good players, not top 32 for me, but I think they both could, could, I shouldn't emphasize, go inside the first round, of course. Cooper, I think somewhere in the range of like 35 to 45 in my guess for him. Uh, I think with Cooper, it kind of goes back to the Cooper DeGene conversation is, do you want this to be a true inside linebacker, stand up inside linebacker? Do you want to play off the edge? He had eight sacks last year. He had half a sack in his career prior to last year. And he absolutely killed Alabama last year. <laughs> Anybody who wants to, if the Packers draft Edger and Cooper, I guarantee the most popular YouTube video uh, in the state of Wisconsin will end up being Edgerrick Cooper highlights against Alabama uh, because it was as yeah. impactful of a defensive performance as maybe any that I watched over the yeah. past he's flying around nine months. Yeah, he's flying around. He's just completely embarrassing the Alabama offensive line that, of course, is well coached and had lots of talent as well. Um, Peyton Wilson, I thought, had the best tape of any of the linebackers. Uh, he is just he's, he's, he's a maniac. I said that affectionately about Peyton Wilson. He'll hit anything incredibly fast. If you go and watch his sacks from this past year, Pretty much all of them are like sacks in which he should have had no chance to actually bring the quarterback down, but the closing speed is real from Peyton He's Wilson. So fast. so fast. I mean, that 4 4 3, actually, like that's one of those where when a guy runs a super fast 40 time at the combine, there are times where you're like, you know, I, I know what he ran. I just don't see it, right? Peyton Wilson, it's like that totally checks out, right? Xavier Worthy, 4 2 1, like really checks out. But 443 for Peyton Wilson absolutely checks out. And so versatile, played off the edge some at NC State. Big question marks for him. 
almost 24 years old. A lot of older prospects get used to that people. NIL, yeah. most of the COVID years, got a lot of guys sticking around in college longer than, new, than normal. And he's got serious shoulder and knee injuries on the medical ledger. So uh, every team's going to see things a little bit differently. I don't know if I am painting with too broad of a brush, but you know, I still classify in my very non-scientific medical rankings, the Packers, uh, amongst the more conservative. I think that's very yeah. yeah, I think we're still there, right? I mean, I think about in recent years, like the progress of Christian Watson coming back, sort of very, it's been a very methodical process. It's been fine. The guy's a really good player, obviously. You want to protect a player like that. But um, I don't know if that means the Packers would shy away from a guy like Peyton Wilson in the second round, because I think he ends up going there even with the medical risk baked in. But I think that pick 41, that's the, the Jets pick, right? 41 or 42? Yep, yep. Yeah. So 41 ends up aligning really well with the Packers as far as like where that linebacker run could begin or take place. Um, Junior they Colson is the it. other name. Yeah, they could. They could. Um, the last name I think that will be mentioned is like a potential second round pick at linebacker, at least in my book, would be Junior Colson from Michigan. Yeah. He's tough. He's super tough I and mean, super physical. If anybody watched Michigan last year, he played with casts on both of his hands for a portion of the season. Yeah. Um, he's old school. Like, I think if this was 1987, he'd be like a top 25 pick, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Big question is, and I don't, this might matter, it might not matter to people. I mean, you may say it's too small of a sample size, but zero interceptions and zero forced fumbles during his college career. So, mm. uh, ball production. Yeah. Yeah. On ball production just wasn't. You know, there's certain guys like Jalen Ford from uh, from Texas had like four interceptions in a single season. They're guys who are just more prone to game changing plays. And there are others who and by the way, there are guys who make long careers just being like rock solid, dependable middle linebackers um, who just pile up the tackles and do the dirty work. So I have a slightly lower grade on Junior Colson than those guys, in part because of the fact that those two players that we mentioned in Cooper and also Peyton Wilson, I think, add more game-changing play factor to them. Uh, but Colson's a really good player too. The There's been an interesting discussion that we've had on our show and, and that has been taking place among people who cover the Packers and follow these these thresholds closely, the trends. Yeah. You know, the Packers have these types, right? That they, they want certain things out of their receivers, certain things out of their offensive linemen. And one of them is um, they like their offensive tackles in particular, even if they're going to play guard, to Long play line. a lot. Yeah. Oh, play a lot. Yeah. And so, okay, um, JC Latham, Amarius Mims, Tyler Guy, like these guys are incredible physical specimens. They've got all this potential. Not that the Packers are going to have the chance to draft all of those guys, but Amarius I mean, Mims has eight career starts. I think Tyler Guyton has 14 career starts. Yeah. How do you how do you bake in to use your phrasing that that in the evaluation going, okay, we know eight, eight career starts. That's not very, very much. But when you watch, you go, like I watched Amarius Mims going, holy crap, this guy. It's ridiculous. It hit 803 career snaps. 803. Yeah. So for those that are saying, like, you mentioned the eight stars. All right. So how much, how many games is 800? They're probably snaps? big 12 teams that played, like, big 12 tackles that played 800 starts last year or 800 yeah. snaps. Yeah. Joe Alt had more snaps than that last year for Notre Dame. Yeah. So I, I keep using that as one of my data points, but I'm sure there are lots of other tackles that were ahead of that. I mean, Javon Foster from Missouri, the guys played like 3,000 snaps or something <laughs> ridiculous. Jordan yeah. Morgan, same deal. Probably Cooper uh, Beebe. Yep. Cooper Beebe's played a ton of snaps. Like, um, so I, I just, here's what I'd say though, is that, all the, the experienced offensive linemen uh, in the first round, there are a couple that I just don't think will get there for, for Green Bay, like right. Tali Fuaga, who I do think is a right tackle. You know, I think they're I think the Packers probably have a vision for Elton Jenkins to stay there. Um, so I think they're looking more towards the guys that have that left tackle flexibility. I'm not quite there with Tali Fuaga in terms of believing he's a guaranteed uh, left tackle prospect. Yeah. He's super experienced, but I think he's gone by 25. I think it's kind of a moot point there. Um but a lot of the guys who have the athletic upside to play left tackle uh, are also green, right? I mean, you mentioned three of them. Olu Fashionu is like experienced, and he's only played three years in college, right? Mm -hmm. um, Troy Fautano, I think, is probably long gone as well. He's got plenty of experience. So there's probably some give and take here. Like, uh, I don't want to say that these all of these historical trends from the Packers – um, are going to be broken this year. I will say though that I do feel like for the past, like really under Goody, I do feel like, I don't know, we've seen so many rule breaker moments that nothing I would agree. surprise me. So if Tyler Guyton's there, I get it. He's raw, 14 career starts. This was a guy who, you know, barely played last year. Now Oklahoma had two tackles that were drafted last year. But like, if you watch that guy, it's like freaky. Him, him and Maris Mims, both of them are freaky. And if you told me five years from now, either of them was a Pro Bowl tackle, I would say that tracks. It just means they landed in a really good spot where a team was willing to be patient on them. But that might be where Green Bay has a leg up, is that with Rasheed Walker already in place, who's played some good ball and 
Uh, my guy, Rob Domofsky, had a piece on him on Thursday morning that was pretty illuminating about, you know, maybe more effective than might, you might realize. I just think, though, that uh, the Packers probably feel, this would be my own guess, is that they feel like they need to aim for a higher ceiling left tackle, given the importance of that position uh, and because of the fact that they've nailed so many other spots in the draft in recent years. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if they, right now. Oh, God. I mean, <laughs> he's just been it's it's ridiculous. Uh, it's fun to see. It's kind of his, uh, you know, it's his vindication for uh, for obviously it was tough. You know, it's tough when you, I mean, you have to make a difficult trade like trading a four time MVP. Like there's there's no easy way to do that. Right. Um, and uh, he had to. I don't know how much he pays attention to this kind of stuff. My guess is probably not that much, but you know, obviously you got to live with the blowback. I mean, I'm sure there were Packers fans that were despondent because just on principle, right? I mean, Aaron Rodgers was one of the greatest to ever do it for that organization, helped them to a Lombardi trophy. So um, not naive to that side of it, but he's been great recently. Goody has, and uh, he's had, I mean, he's had a ton of respect for a long time around the NFL. So it's no surprise that he is uh, crushing it in his, uh, in his draft success recently. All right, we're going to finish up with field here in just a second on Locked on Packers. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked on Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. Locked on has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked on. Plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Yeah, but I think it's easy to forget now that the reason he got that job is because Houston had was calling and saying, hey, we want you to interview for our GM job. And yeah. the Packers said, uh-uh, yeah, we're going to keep bad. him. He's our guy yeah. now. So, um, that, and, and Elliot Wolf is one of the guys that was up for that job and he's now yeah. running the show in New England. So yep. um, the, the Ron Wolf, Ted Thompson tentacles are, are very They're long everywhere. in yeah. the NFL right now. Yeah. Uh, one more position group I wanted to hit with you, Field, um, because I feel like the opinions are all over the place on these guys, mm-hmm. is running back. Yeah. Um, right. And there is no that elite talent not there, although I think, you know, Jonathan Brooks had a chance to to go, you know, top 40, maybe even first round. And I, I know uh, your partner, Mel Kuyper, has been, has been harping on that. Like, hey, if this guy was healthy, he might have been a first round pick. Yep. The Packers, they bring back A.J. Dillon. They sign Josh Jacobs in a pretty surprising set of moves, yeah. both of those really. They need some juice. They need some speed. And luckily, yeah. this is a class where Jalen Wright, Trey Benson, Isaac Gorendo, like there are some guys with some real juice in this class. How do you how do you stack up this class and where do you think they might be able to find some value here? Yeah, how you value the position or what you value in the position is going to matter so much this year with the running back draft class. In the in a vacuum, you know, I'm impressed with the job to ta- to rank these guys one through five, one through ten, one through. I think I have something like 37 running backs that I have evaluated and put a grade on. Um, so like I, I do have a, a hierarchy. Like number one for me is Trey Benson from Florida State. Jonathan Brooks would have been there, but because of the injury and the possibility, he either needs a little bit of time at the beginning of the season or the historical data that supports the running backs in particular need kind of a full year to become their, their right. old self, whether it's Saquon Barkley, Dalvin Cook, just a couple of the guys that have dealt with injuries uh, of that nature recently that have needed that full kind of like get back to normal year. But the reason I bring that up is um, – Brooks would have, yeah, he would have been my number one back. Probably wouldn't have been a first round pick for me still, but probably, you know, I think you're right, like a top 40 ish range. Um, but then it gets into it just like a style play. So Jalen Wright, Tennessee, super fast, a little tight in the hips, but man, that kid can like pull his foot in the ground and go. If you run an outside zone, maybe the Packers know a thing or two about that. Mm. You might be interested in a player like Jalen Wright, probably in the third round there. Uh, Braylon Allen, of course, is well known in, in those parts. Heard of him? Yep. Yeah. Hulking. I mean, the most impressive looking kid, probably the entire draft. Still can't um, even buy drink, buy a drink legally. Twenty years old, youngest player, Crazy. one of the youngest players in the entire class. The question would be just what version you're getting. Are you getting a guy that was an absolute workhorse for two years, or are you getting a guy who? I mean, so much of Wisconsin last year. And I'm not trying to take away from Coach Fickle. This is the reality of college it was football. A that was a seismic shift, right? That was going from, you know, yeah. that was just such a different style on both sides of the ball, but offensively, like Tanner Bordellini, their center, like I, I'm, I'm being facetious here, but like he may have never snapped a shotgun snap prior to last year, right? And then it's like all he does. So yeah. um, Allen didn't have a great, he didn't have a, a dominant year. And you'd think a guy who with that kind of physical stature, 240 pounds would be just an absolute hammerhead. Didn't run like a hammerhead all the time last year, but 
I still think there's a chance the team sees him as like a potential starting back, gets in the power there. Maybe he goes in the fourth round. So uh, there are a lot of guys that kind of just like, it's a matter of what you're looking for, right? Um, I don't know that Blake Corum is like a specific style of back, but I think Blake Corum's a guy who teams are going to gravitate towards the pedigree there. He is his determination, his will, his physicality, like all of that is so, so good that I guarantee you, if he's taking free draft visits right now, teams are going to fall in love with Blake Corum, the person on top of the very productive player. So um, I think it's probably more down to the styles and guys like Jalen Wright are very different than Braylon Allen or very different than Marshawn Lloyd. So it would have to be kind of a vision for your offense. If you're looking to add speed specifically, Jalen Wright, certainly amongst the names you need to know. You mentioned Isaac Garendo as well another former Badger, yeah. who uh, like basically broke all the speed models given his size and his <laughs> yeah. time speed. Um, he's one of the great mysteries in the draft because I've, I've talked to scouts about this. They're like, you've watched it. Yeah. You were there. Yeah. What happened? And they don't have a good answer. They don't have a reason as to why this kid wasn't playing a whole lot more other than probably circumstance. So he is the classic, gets drafted in the fourth or fifth round has a stretch as a rookie or a second year player where he balls it out. We're all like, huh? Yeah. Why did this guy wait? Why did it take this long for this guy to get drafted? Yeah. I, the, the name that I go back to with that one is Keaton Mitchell. Could he be Ke the same sort of like, you know, not the ideal size, but man it can absolutely fly. And if you yeah. get in the right offense, all of a sudden he's just like breaking off these 50 yard runs and you're like, geez, like what, how did that, who hot, what is going on here? So yeah. that, that's a, that's a good one. Is there last thing? Um, just just one surprise. You want to predict something. Give me a little like, hey, you might not be thinking about this right now, but on draft night, this could happen. You might go, wait, that's that's interesting. I keep wondering two things. If Troy Fautano goes in the top 10, and then if Chop Robinson maybe is the first or second pass rusher off the mm. board. No idea there. I mean, these are all just like it's it's so much of the draft is parsing out what's real and what's fake. Um, so I don't want to sit here and tell you that I have like great information that like guarantees either of those things are correct. But uh, like thoughts that I've either had or someone has passed along to me that I haven't totally dismissed, those would be two of them that kind of come to mind there. Chop Robinson is a litmus test, right? Or a Rorschach test, I should say. Like it's, yeah. Some people love him. Some people have less interest in him. But that first step quickness and the natural pass rush juice in a league that pass rushers are needed, hard to ignore. Absolutely. All right, Field, we will be uh, listening to you with Mel, uh, of course, watching you with ESPN Plus, ESPN2. All over the place. I think both plus and two, yeah, actually. I think it's both. So, um, yeah. Uh, so this, this is great. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Afield, for joining the show today. Awesome, awesome to talk with him. Uh, ran into him at the Super Bowl. He had a lot to say about the Packers, which is like excited to talk about Jordan Love and Jeff Halfley and all this stuff. So um, a really a really great guy, in addition to being a hell of a football media person. Uh, back next week. So much more as we get closer. Um, we will be under two weeks then. I'm I'm kind of wishing we had the draft now. I mean, what, what are we waiting for here? What are we really waiting for here? Be for real. Um, follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on the X Machine. Uh, Locked on Packers. Follow it on Instagram. Follow it on TikTok. Go subscribe on Facebook. Go uh, subscribe on YouTube. Anywhere you get podcasts so you can stay Locked on Packers.